Buonasera a tutti, good evening and welcome to the Italian Radio Hour. Io sono Viviana and I would like to welcome back our regular listeners and also welcome any new listeners. Also be sure to like us on Instagram and Facebook at Italian Radio Hour and subscribe to our YouTube channel to catch up on any past video interviews. Vorrei dare il benvenuto ai nostri ascoltatori da tutto il mondo, grazie per essere con noi anche oggi mentre continuiamo il nostro viaggio per l'Italia e la cultura italiana. So today we're actually going to talk about the Italy present in Pittsburgh uh, by talking about the legacy of an amazing artist, which is uh, Virgil Cantini. Cantini was uh, a vital part of Pittsburgh's public art scene in the 20th century and always believed that art should be free and available to everyone. Uh, the successful mission uh, of relocating 20 of his panels in the uh, steel um, plaza building, the T uh, tunnel, um, is a mission that has brought together many community leaders and many preservationists. So in today's conversation, I'm actually honored to have um, Virgil Cantini's uh, daughter, uh, Lisa Cantini Seguin, Brittany Raleigh, Board of Directors of Preservation Pittsburgh, and Melissa Marinero, the uh, Director of the Italian American uh, Program at the Heinz History Center. Stay tuned, don't go away, una piccola pubblicità. Parli italiano? Do you want to learn, improve, or master your Italian? Istituto Mondo Italiano can help. Located in the heart of Region Square, Mondo Italiano offers small group classes and one-on-one -on -one private tutoring in person or online to help you learn Italian in no time. Visit us online at istitutomondoitaliano.org. Well, welcome, welcome everyone. How are you today? Good. Good morning. Excellent. Good morning. So we have some familiar faces and some new faces. And this is uh, a topic that has been uh, dear to, obviously, not only the um, our um, my three guests today, but for the entire city of Pittsburgh, um, as uh, Virgil Cantini, as I said before, has blessed our city with many of his um, artwork. And as um, priorities in the city change, or taste, or new developments arise, unfortunately, there is a risk that some major masterpieces might be buried under gravel. And this is what could have been the faith of an amazing uh, 20 panel uh, work by Virgil Cantini that was um, in a tunnel and uh, um, from, I believe 2018, uh, joint efforts and uh, to create awareness from the public and the stakeholders eventually, just recently, brought to a, 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 a big uh, success. But before we're going to get into this uh, specific mission, I would like to start uh, with uh, you, Lisa, uh, okay. obviously okay. being uh, the daughter of uh, Maestro Cantini. Um, I'm always curious to learn about the artist before it became the artist. So we have a great journey of the family uh, from Italy to the United States, I believe, uh, your grandfather came in first, yes, and yes. Uh, it was some time before your father, your mother, and I believe six additional siblings uh, exactly. made it to Pittsburgh. Can you tell us a little bit about the stories that you might heard uh, growing up about their transition from the old world to the new world? Certainly. Um, as you mentioned, my dad's father, who would have been my what, grandfather, um, he was here in the U.S. before he brought his wife and children, and the, he wanted to establish himself. I believe he had an import company. He imported boots or something from Italy. I was never sure on that. But in 1929, he provided or saved up enough money to provide transport for his wife and seven children to come to the United States. And they came through Ellis Island and I've seen all the records that they have there. And my father always talks about right before he came, he was out chasing a goat in their village and he fell and split his head open. And on one of the documents on Ellis Island, it makes a notation that, you know, he had a slash on his forehead, but they moved to Weirton, West Virginia because they, his older brothers could find work in the steel mills. And so that's where my dad grew up. He was 10 years old when he came to this country 
And he said they lived across the street from the mills and um, his mother had a garden and you wouldn't, he said, you wouldn't think anything could grow across from a steel mill, but she knew how to compost. So she would bury fish heads and vegetables, whatever. And so she harvested their vegetables from that garden. And he said going to school was difficult because mm -hmm. he didn't speak English. And in those days, they didn't have ESL classes. Mm -hmm. So he said he he always told us the kids called him a spaghetti eater. And they oh. made fun of him because his clothes were different. Mm -hmm. And he, when he was in high school, he started playing football. And that allowed him, he was a All-American quarterback. And that allowed him, he was offered scholarships to college. And so he went to Manhattan College in New York and stayed there one year and then transferred to Carnegie Tech, now Carnegie Mellon, because he mm -hmm. wanted a better art program. And he played as a fullback for um, Carnegie Tech at that time. And then um, he was drafted into the Army, World War II, stationed most of his time in North Africa, and then came back and finished his last year at Tech. And he met my mom. She was another art student. And they got married. And then he taught art at Shenley High School when it mm -hmm. was still around. And uh, at the same time, worked on his master's degree at Pitt and then was hired into a very small studio arts department at Pitt, mm -hmm. which in his later years, he expanded to a major and was kind of like the founder of that department. And he spent, I think it was close to 38 years as an art teacher at Pitt, all the time in the summer doing artwork, mm -hmm. big commissions for different people because during the school year, he was consumed with students and classes and all that goes with being a college professor or university professor. Yes. Well, actually you covered a pretty long span uh, and of his, uh, of his life. And uh, there's some, um, I don't know if there, uh, you know, curiosity that I have uh, found as I was doing my um, research, first of all, uh, the one thing that actually surprised me that when you uh, read his, uh, his bio, they always put Illy uh, for his place of birth. And and then from for his uh, place of uh, death, they say Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Can we be a little more specific about where exactly Nilly is from to give credit to his birthplace? <laughs> um, Pietra Sancieri. Okay. okay. South of Rome, up in the mountains. My uh, younger son actually visited it. Okay. A few years mm -hmm. ago, he had to attend a friend's wedding. Mm -hmm. And he said it reminded him of the farm that my father purchased in Somerset, Pennsylvania, the same type of landscape and rolling hills. So there was a reason why he ended up with a plot of ground out in the country. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. then we're talking about 1929, 1930. Obviously, there are different things happening both in Italy and uh, the United States. So, um, um, you know that that for um, you know in Italy we know that uh, uh, that there was the um, the period of Mussolini, so that would have been uh, probably a high risk of being somehow recruited into the uh, army, into yeah. into the army. And uh, the curious little thing that uh, I found about his first day of school. Um, and then, as I said, if if you're familiar with this story, obviously being uh, being the daughter, but. Uh, what the journalist was indicating um, is that obviously the grandfather had been living here in the U.S. And when the mother and uh, the children arrived, he said, well, tomorrow everyone is going to school. And grandmother was a little concerned because the kids didn't speak uh, the language. I said, well, if he needs to go to the ba uh, to the bathroom, he just uh, uh, raises his hand and says the bug house, not uh -huh. the back house that I had heard before. But it was the first, uh, he said, because I guess, uh, you know, those places at that time had a lot of flies. And uh, so came the day during uh, uh, the class where uh, Virgil needed, little Virgil needed to go to the bathroom and raise his hand and said bug house. And unfortunately, that created a little bit of laughter because I guess they just called the toilet at that point. 
I never heard that story from him. <laughs> So, uh, but uh, anyway, obviously, you know, also, Melissa, you can maybe give us an idea of what uh, Pittsburgh was in the 30s, because from what I hear, um, uh, it was still obviously steel mills, a lot of smoggy uh, town. Uh, can you kind of depict what uh, yeah. the Pittsburgh in those years could have looked like and felt like? Absolutely. Um, you know, that period at the end of the 1920s, you know, we're getting into what will soon be the Great Depression. Um, but for those people who are immigrants to the United States, um, and especially those from Italy and Eastern Europe, we're in a period where immigration is being restricted. So it's not... Um, easy for anyone from Italy to come to the United States or countries like Poland and, and other places in Eastern Europe, um, they would have had to have had uh, a family member, someone who's an American citizen. And so in the case of the Cantini family, because Virgil's father is already living and working in the United States, there is a path for the family to get to the US. Um, so this interwar period, you know, when we look at who's able to come to the US and who isn't, uh, I often look at what our immigration policy was at the time. Um, and you're absolutely right about the concerns of the sons being drafted into the military once they reached a certain age, because that was Italy's law at the time. And what Virgil ends up experiencing in the United States just, you know, um, still within his formative years is being a part of the U.S. military, which is a pretty, pretty typical path we see for um, people who came, especially those men who came as children in this interwar period, a lot of them do end up serving in the U.S. military. And it's very interesting to see the way that they look at their own identities as being Italian born, being in the American military, and then being in a position of mm -hmm. at, at one point in Virgil's life being on the other side um, of the conflict. And so it's a, a challenging period, but it's a period where identity issues, um, and I think from the Italian perspective, I've always been really interested in the way Virgil's Italian culture is expressed throughout his lifetime because it wasn't always easy to do so in the era that he came to the United States. The um, Italian American community was still struggling to be accepted in what we would see as mainstream American society in that time period. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Uh, Lisa, going back to you. Um, uh, so when we talk about the early work of your father, uh, I believe there was also uh, religious art uh, as the early production of, um, um, of, his, uh, of his work. Can you elaborate a little more if there is any work that stands out? Well, my dad was a devout Catholic. And in 1958, he had received a Guggenheim Fellowship to study sacred art in Europe. And so my sister and I were, I think seven and five years old at the time. And so we boarded a ship in January from New York City and we went to Genoa and we lived in Florence. We lived in Rome, we lived in Paris, we lived in Madrid, Barcelona, et cetera. And everywhere we went, we went to churches. And I remember my sister and I saying, we don't want to go to another church and look at bones of saints. But um, yeah, he was, that was a definitely a very big part of his career was creating religious art. He's done um, candelabras for Catholic churches. He did, um, um, I think, the fronts to tabernacles all out of enamel and cloisonne. I mean, there were, and then stations of the cross. I mean, we still have, I think, two sets of them at our house. And I remember one set was in the basement of St. Paul's Cathedral, and then they changed up their decor. And I believe they ended up somewhere in Washington, D.C. But they, they were every type of, Oh, craft. Some were done on um, tile that he painted and some mm -hmm. were done on enamel and some were paintings. It just depended 
um, there is really quite a bit of artwork that he did. Um, he did very large rugs. He did things with the Alpha and the Omega and um, the cock crowing three times to betray Christ. There's a big rug that he did like that. Um, so it was definitely very much a part of his life was creating art for religious reasons. Mm -hmm. we, have, um, we have sculptures and paintings and all sorts of things. Actually, talking about paintings, uh, the hand of Jesus uh, um, um, that is uh, uh, with an eye on the palm and uh, right. uh, with a white hand and the one with a black hand kind of questioning the depictions of uh, Christ as a white man um, that is uh, kind of wanted to pose uh, kind of new questions and keep uh, an open mind. So Right. Yeah, he was, a, he was very much interested in the symbolism in Christian art. And I think a lot of that he picked up studying all of the um, churches and the religious art in Europe, in the museums and in the churches. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, when we obviously talk about uh, it, let me kind of backtrack. Um, sometimes we drive in, in front of artwork for years and we notice it, but we don't notice it. And it is actually thanks to a tour that was uh, uh, led by Melissa and Brittany that actually came to find out more about uh, Virgil's um, uh, continuous work around uh, the University of Pittsburgh uh, campus. And, uh, and then things started to click. You know, you drive through East Liberty, you see the fountain, and then you started to recognize, um, again, whether it's the symbolism, uh, or the um, style of the artist. Uh, but there is still that walk through the steel plaza, the, the tea that we'll have to do, because this is kind of um, the project that has brought all of you uh, together at the Heinz History, his, uh, history uh, recently to have a wonderful panel discussion of things that have happened, uh, I believe, since 2018 or maybe even earlier. Oh, and yeah. that involved all of you. So um, at this point, I'm going to pass it on to Brittany. Uh, you are originally from Pittsburgh, uh, but uh, you are kind of a, a recent, uh, you relocated recently to Pittsburgh, so to speak. So how did you become acquainted with what was happening or how did you um, get to cross path with uh, Lisa and eventually what it became a shared mission? Yeah, so it was, um, I am from Pittsburgh. So um, yeah, I'm a, I'm a student of art history and art management and a lover of modern architecture and modern public art. Um, so yeah, I came back to Pittsburgh, it would have been around approaching 2017. And kind of um, with those interests in mind, um, exploring and finding ways to program and share um, artists uh, and public art that um, were of interest to me to do a deeper dive and kind of connect with um, an audience and, and community here. So uh, Virgil Cantini was of great interest to me and I was just fascinated by the um, range of especially his abstract and large scale public work around University of Pittsburgh um, and, and elsewhere. And so um, yeah, compiled a, a tour to um, do just that, e explore some of those pieces. Um, and in that research and programming, um, connected with both um, Melissa and Lisa, who were invaluable resources in kind of offering support and input and um, insight in, into these works. And, um, you know, the, the mosaic, oops, yeah, you're pulling up a photo. I thought I lost you. Um, <laughs> <laughs> through that process, uh, coming to, as, as you're sharing this image now of the original location of the, um, yeah, total of 28 um, mosaic panels, but this kind of one comprehensive artwork, to me, this was the most intriguing of his public works and that it was so immersive, tucked behind the U.S. Steel Building, um, a pedestrian tunnel that kind of connects the Lower Hill District to downtown. Um, 
so Lisa and I, um, in kind of inquiring with her about this um, public site, you know, I had heard rumblings that this this work was at risk, and uh, a meeting with Lisa kind of confirmed that for me and helped me to understand that, you know, for some time she had been um, uh, kind of informed about and and kind of facing this challenge that um, the mosaic would be um, removed from the site, as you said, <laughs> buried, um, because the city had planned uh, the um, kind of refresh of the site with a new public um, park space. And their navigation of that planning did not include um, kind of saving or reintegrating um, the mosaics as a whole installation. Um, there's kind of a lot of layers of um, different kind of solutions that perhaps were considered but you know our our kind of team effort that is preservationists um experts on the artists and the period um pittsburgh history and the family were were that you know we really wanted to make sure we conveyed this as a holistic work and and um yeah, so that's how how we connected, and we can all talk a little bit about how that preservation and advocacy process unfolded from yes, I would say 2017 mm -hmm. um, through until <laughs> just recently, when finally we can direct our friends and colleagues to go see the newly restored uh, mosaic at the uh, Steel Plaza T station. So it probably, yes, required efforts from many different uh, uh, directions and many different organizations. So yes, feel free to elaborate a little more about um, uh, what might have been the opportunities, the uh, obstacles, appeals. Um, I believe one of the uh, initial appeals um, that was successfully that one was the definition um, of these um, panels of have historical value, I believe something something of that kind. That first it wasn't recognized as such, but then some efforts went into that uh, recognition. I can talk about that a little bit <laughs> because that's where the Italian American collection played a really important role because. Uh, I, I actually knew Lisa for a few years before this uh, because Lisa had donated her father's papers and photographs uh, to the History Center. So what's important to know is that beyond just having examples of Virgil's artwork, which did include um, some religious subject matter, but also uh, a great football painting um, and some other pieces that show his range as an artist, mm -hmm. um, she had mentioned to me what was going on and she had directed Brittany to come and do research in the library. And so I had said to Brittany, there are some things I have seen in this collection that are that would be important for some of the agencies and authorities that were involved in the conversation around what is happening with this artwork that, um, in a way it challenged what they were saying about the mosaic. And, and to your point earlier, when we were talking about the liturgical art, it is true that Cantini created quite a lot of art that was religious in nature, but it was not correct to say that was the only subject matter that he worked with. And that was one of the conversations. There were other ones too, um, but what we were required to do was to provide evidence, and we did so through looking at his body of work that exists in the public, as well as this wonderful resource of his own papers and records and photographs and things that he himself deemed as important. Um, that helped us to argue the historic status of it. It also helped us because we have blueprints um, mm -hmm. We have the letters that were exchanged between the URA and Virgil Cantini. So we also have those administrative records, those schemas and very important documents that ended up being instrumental around discussing what solutions were even possible and what was the artist's intention in creating this work. Mm -hmm. It's true when, you know, you don't always have such a comprehensive archival collection to support your work in research and advocacy. And it is 
absolutely vital and so incredibly special when it is available as a resource um, because it empowers um, the group to exactly as Melissa is conveying kind of um, share uh you know, those kind of visuals or sometimes technical documents, correspondence, you name it and everything in between that will kind of support um, what it is you want to convey in, um, you know, advocating that that this work has a very important place in modern art history, in Pittsburgh's public art history and in Cantini's career. So working with uh, Melissa and that collection was just again, vital to, to the whole scenario. So, and, and I'll just insert that, um, without being long-winded about what can be the kind of complex, um, um, you know, layers of historic preservation, um, processes, essentially when federal funding is involved or on the line for a new development, in this case, it would have been the new public cap park, um, uh, on the site that is now finished, um, uh, downtown because federal funding was involved, um, that, that triggers that, um, the section 106 process, which is, um, part of the national historic preservation act that requires that federal agencies assess the site, um, for any, um, historic, uh, elements that might be put at risk because of this new development. So those could be a built structure, those could be an archeological um, component, those could be a public artwork as was in this case. So, you know, initial cursory reviews did not fully kind of accept or tackle that this 1960s mosaic could be, should be a, a historic um, aspect that would be absolutely put at risk by the new development. So thankfully for section 106, that sets up, we must go through a very thorough process of a range of agencies kind of conducting this review and inviting consulting parties. Consulting parties can be preservation organizations, they can be um, citizens of Pittsburgh that have, for whatever reason, an interest in this, um, this historic aspect. And that, that process allows us to provide input on, um, why, but yeah, the, the important component is that, um, the artwork had to be deemed eligible for the National Register of Historic Places to kind of, as, as the first step to kind of continue with that process. So, um, you know, writing the narrative that makes it eligible is is a is a great opportunity that we don't always have have the chance to do. So that kind of laid the groundwork for the rest of of that unfolding um, <laughs> for years to come. But again, that was finally gets us to today. Um, and I'll just say that it's public artwork is especially vulnerable and we can talk about that a bit. You so often find this is not its original location. I mean, at best it has been moved, you know, to a new site that has a completely different context and is often unfortunately robbed of what, what was the original setting, you know, and that informed the artists on, on all of this. So, um, though it was relocated, this was a really unique, um, and special scenario from the preservation perspective, like, wow, it happened. <laughs> it was saved, you know, it, it's not always the, the typical story. So before we dive in into some of the uh, maybe details of uh, <clears throat> what happened to the panels, <clears throat> and then what happens also when um, additional art is either put in storage or uh, relocated, uh, a couple of words from our sponsors. Un caffè per favore. My first cup of coffee sets the tone for my entire day and I get my coffee at La Prima Espresso. La Prima has been brewing Pittsburgh's best coffee for nearly 35 years. <clears throat> Try any of their in-house roasted varieties of beans from all over the world at home or come and enjoy an espresso or a cappuccino at any of their locations where their friendly baristas and familiar faces will make you feel at home. Visit laprima.com to get La Prima Espresso coffee at your door. Applying for Italian citizenship? Need documents translation? 
Instituto Mundo Italiano provides certified translations and assistance services. Be sure to visit us at institutomondoitaliano.org and schedule your free consultation. Okay, we are back. And uh, so 28 panels, which I'm going to start sharing some pictures of their current um, location. And then uh, Lisa, anyone that wants to give us a little bit of um, the description and also the technique used, because uh, my, understand my understanding is uh, the way that also Virgil uh, worked with his pieces, it was indeed great things that will last forever. Um, um, so it's also the uh, technique is very complex and uh, the processes. And then um, from the panel, we'll move to some of the other pieces that are within the University of Pittsburgh uh, campus that um, kind of uh, uh, accompany, uh, you know, the students as they walk down certain places. But uh, let me go ahead and uh, uh, so as I said, if Brittany or uh, uh, Melissa or Lisa want to continue about the, the logistics, um, what happened to the uh, mosaics um, if they needed, so if they come out as panels restored, Tell us a little bit about what we wouldn't um, nor know about it. Sure. I can um, start to give just some basics that are kind of interesting to think about in terms of any collection. So we at the History Center maintain our collections and these pieces that are owned by the city of Pittsburgh, it's their collection. So that's what makes these unique when we think about collections is that this piece did have an owner. The owner of the piece was the city of Pittsburgh. Mm -hmm. And as Brittany pointed out, the city of Pittsburgh was making a plan. And whenever there is renovation, um, at least moving for, from the 1960s forward. So in a way, this piece is as old as the legislation we're talking about and the processes we're talking about um, because we wanted to see communities and neighborhoods not have their historic pieces at risk because there were points in American history where there wasn't an avenue for a voice for those communities um, to do what is called mitigation. Um, mitigation is looking at if we have a piece and a piece is at risk, what is it that we we do? Because we've already determined it, there'd be an adverse effect if we bury this. We've determined that would not be the best thing for this collections piece. And so we talked with the um, agencies and the steward of this collection, the city of Pittsburgh, about what could be done. And that's where, as a group, we started to have conversations around what could that look like? Um, and I think we it was so valuable to have Lisa in the conversation because Lisa grew up with her father. She saw him work. She she knew um, more than we knew what he would have wanted. But but the collection, the resources told us. So that's sort of what we would communicate as the advocates is this would be the best thing that could happen. We recognize if the best thing can't happen, here's the second best thing could happen. Here's the third best thing that could happen. And so we, before we even tested anything, begun to see if these this was feasible, those were the sort of conversations we were having as a group. Um, Lisa, uh, how were you feeling uh, along all this long time? Um, you know, it was a long, pro it was a marathon. It was not a sprint. Uh, at <laughs> any point, do you feel a little despair or um, no. uh, tell us a little bit about uh, your end of? Uh... No, it was um, the despair part came when we first got the letter from the city in 2016. And then in 2017, my husband and I were sitting here going, what do we do now? Do the city would allow us to write a paragraph to deliver to the arts council. And then we thought, you just don't bury art. What should we do? Should we hire a lawyer? And then I met Brittany and um, at this tour that she did of my dad's public art, there were a few other preservationists there and I knew nothing about 106 or how do you do something like this? Because as Melissa pointed out, the city owned the artwork. I mean, my, it was a commission. 
my dad was paid to make it. So therefore they own it. So what, how much rights do I have? But Brittany led the charge. And if it hadn't been for Brittany connecting all of these dots, I I think the the original plan was to save three three panels and donate them. I think they wanted to donate them to Heinz History Center and the rest would have been buried. They said they would photograph each one and they would do a video. And that was the plan. So, I mean, it was all, I met Brittany at the right time and she connected with others and she knew about preserving public art and that's how it all went on. I mean, I never gave up. I mean, it was frustrating at times because we had phone meetings for a while with people from the federal government, the state government and the city and all of these consulting agencies and people. I, I think sometimes there were probably 30 people commenting and, you know, chiming in and you're like, well, I never know. And they're all in government acronyms. So you don't really know what they do, but. And then it went on to, there were a core group of consulting party people. There were about seven or eight of us that saw it through to the end. And um, there were hurdles to overcome. I never gave up. I figured eventually we would find a new location for it. I just wanted it to be a safe one. I know the one group at one point they were considering relocating it on the uh, riverfront trails. Mm -hmm. And I didn't think that was a very good idea to put mosaics that were already, what, 60 years old out in the elements, you know, and anyway, they ended up in the right place and they look fantastic, mm -hmm. but it was everybody working together that made the whole thing happen. Because I, I mean, you asked earlier about how mosaics are made. I mean, my dad made those in a studio and he he had, I think, sketches because he knew how long the tunnel was. He had to work with the engineers that were designing it. So he knew the length and then he designed shapes and those shapes were made in a metal frame. And then he worked in something called plasticine. And I, that one image you showed where there were ridges mm -hmm. of colors and concrete he would do that in the plasticine and then he inserted the mosaics, which are glass tile or tesserae. And then he imported all of those from Italy. And he had number 10 cans in his studio on shelves with orange, blue, green, yellow, you know, metallic, whatever. And he would insert them into the plasticine. And then he poured a specific type of concrete in it. And then once that dried, he reversed it and pulled the plasticine off. I mean, think of a Play-Doh that children would use. You, it, you can pull the plasticine off. And then after they were all done, he had the, the city remove them. And then there were engineers that he worked with that inset them into the walls. I believe that's how they were originally hung. Brittany may remember, I couldn't go to the take down but then they were inset into the walls of the pedestrian underpass and the Carrara marble was put around them mm -hmm. so that's how it sort of all came together mm -hmm. I'll and add I something if you don't mind that I just think is really important as I listen to both Lisa and Brittany talk is that um, oh, and there is a picture with some of our other consulting parties, uh, Matthew Falcone, who is with the city of Pittsburgh, Laura Ricketts, who is another um, architectural historian and preservationist, and then Mark Young of PennDOT. Um, also mentioned David Anthony and uh, from PennDOT and Bill Callahan, who couldn't join us. Um, he was from the State Historic Preservation Office. What we as a group sort of early on really agreed upon, um, and it was good that as a group we had our own um, mission because, as Lisa said, sometimes we'd be on a call with 30 different people, sometimes we'd be four or five years in and we'd be talking to a whole new batch of people and we all knew the story, but they didn't, and so 
we worked very hard, not just to make sure that our mission stayed on target, but that we were being diplomatic and positive, that we were making sure that our conversations um, were staying on topic. And I think it was really good that everybody had that attitude because something that goes on this long can become very unwieldy very quickly. And I think that this group had a nice working relationship that we were very protective of to keep that working relationship uh, positive because I know that we, as you know, Lisa and Brittany had both pointed out, there were hurdles. There were times where you know, sometimes we wouldn't get great news or sometimes we wouldn't get news. Um, and there were moments where we had to just kind of make sure that everybody was um, on track and having the core seven, eight of us doing that work was great because it kept everybody else moving in the right direction too. So I know a lot of the agencies were happy that they had consulting parties that responded to emails, that followed up on things, that offered suggestions, because I got the sense that maybe those communications don't, um, they aren't maybe so consistent, or maybe they even don't get to the opportunity of having these conversations since we know this is a rarity and even getting to this stage of the process. So we all learned a lot um, and we all were very happy to have that opportunity to learn this. Mm -hmm. And in a, in a way, I think it's interesting, like I, I often thought throughout the process, like, wow, this is a really fascinating way that public art has done its job, even though we're facing a challenge with this particular public art needing to be, you know, assessed and ultimately relocated it you know it was our love of 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 this work and our ability to at first convene there and share it with others and you know experience it that was also an important driving force that you know we're we're understanding how this work was once effective in a kind of public forum and how best to make it effective again so it can kind of be replaced to the the city where he wanted it to belong um, in, in the most effective way. And as Lisa and Melissa shared examples, you know, there were, you know, mitigation is a requirement of section 106. There, there must be um, a, some mitigation effort to kind of offset this, um, this uh, adverse effect on the artwork. But, you know, one entity's idea of mitigation might be a unfortunately gross misunderstanding of of the work itself. So for example, um, they may think, wow, keeping three of 28 panels in their original location will be best, right? <laughs> so to help, again, relying on the collection, the artist's records, um, our own present day experience of it to be able to convey, no, actually, you know, the character of this thing will be best completely relocated as one, even if it means finding a completely new location is just, um, you know, part of part of that process. And yes, I, I appreciate uh, Lisa's compliment, but for me, it's that if it weren't for everyone, and when we say everyone, it's, yeah, it's this particular task force that understands how to work together in, in, a, in a bigger picture of several stakeholders um, being at play and just having the pacing and 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 the patience and commitment to the project that sees it through to the end. There's something called burnout <laughs> and it's common in, in preservation because we're all putting our volunteer effort and time um, most often uh, it, it, into this. And so you, you don't know how long the process is going to last, you know, but yes, you know, it's going to be a process. So the, you know, it, it, preservation and the tools we have to be able to achieve these things, it's not designed to be complicated or um, opaque, but unfortunately it, it really can be for, you know, a lot of folks that, you know, I don't have a professional background in preservation. So to be able to, you know, but I've learned so much through my colleagues and conferences and self, uh, self-guided study. So to be able to rely on each other, we had just such a diverse group of historians and archivists and, um, arts administrators and, um, again, family to funnel perspective into this, that, that I think diversity was, was also kind of crucial. Um, and, 
turned out to be something I really enjoyed about, mm -hmm. about the process. Wonderful. <clears throat> So um, I would like to go over some of the other pieces that uh, were um, shown to us during the, uh, you know, the, the tour that uh, um, was led by Melissa and uh, Brittany in 2019, was it the Italian American Studies uh, conference uh, so that uh, we can also share with uh, the public who's going to watch this interview where to go and find these amazing uh, pieces. Some of them uh, might have been relocated, some others got nicknames by the students of the University of Pittsburgh. <laughs> we'll, we'll get to it, but uh, obviously one that um, cannot be missed. And again, uh, Lisa, if you um, have recollection of when your father was working on them and you have some insider information or comments or anything that you want to share, but obviously uh, I think this is where the tour started. Um, so Lisa, what can you tell us from your side of, uh, of the story as far as maybe comments on this uh, uh, piece that your father was working on? Uh, that one is the one outside the law school, if I'm 100% correct. Right. Mm -hmm. And it's my dad, my, yeah, my dad liked to do welding. He also was very good at welding. He Small things, big things, but he wanted to do these outdoor pieces and he tried to figure out what type of metal to use. And so he settled on Corten steel because when it was out in the elements, it could withstand. It really was not rusting. It, it kept its um, integrity. This piece was obviously repainted. Um, but he would weld these in the backyard of our home on South Craig Street. Mm -hmm. And where you're welding large pieces like that, you burn everything around it. And my mother had these gardens all in the perimeter of the yard with her flowers. But every time he had these large sculptures, everything would be burned out and it looked like a drought. And she or would Lucila. <laughs> It would be, she would be very upset. And um, he also, in a lot of his sculptures, that circular piece of glass, he was very interested in the reflection and reflect refraction of light through glass. And so he incorporated glass in a lot of his pieces. Mm -hmm. Now this one, I can't remember. I think he had to do it in pieces and then it was assembled either in a factory, he used Riling Manufacturing Company and he worked with the master welders there because of those, I think those almost look like rivets or bolts in there, but he would not have been able to move that down the alleyway from our backyard to a truck. So I think he made that in three or four pieces and then it was assembled in the man in Riling factory and then moved on site to Pitt. So. I'll add one thing about that piece that I think from a uh, history of our region is interesting is that you know we all know steel and we know especially Corten steel being a product of Pittsburgh by extension, this Western Pennsylvania, Eastern Ohio, sorry, my cat's tail got in the way. Um, <laughs> and if you think, if you look at the center and you look at the glass, glass was actually our industry prior to steel prior to um, the great industrial revolution because of our rivers we were the number one american manufacturer of glass in the um whole you know looking at the late 18th early into the 19th century so i also look at that piece and i can see where there's a bit of a commentary on our region's industry and on the future of where resources are are um, being produced and going. So when I look at that, I also see it as something that a person who grew up in this part of the country has their experiences here. That's something that just would have been ingrained because many of us know that because our families worked in, in those industrial complexes. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I wanted to say too, I, this piece is special because it's, I think David Lawrence Hall um, was mm -hmm. completed in 1967 and this sculpture is 
in its original location. So it was always set there at, at the plaza. So, you know, these kind of, um, you know, the brutalist architecture when, when Pitt was expanding under Chancellor Litchfield in particular, to me, this kind of commission sculpture and that, um, that building in particular is kind of a, a reflection of that moment. And again, unique that it's cited there as it always was. Now, this other uh, picture that I'm sharing from the uh, Dietrich Library Archives from the Heinz History Center shows us the fate of another piece that um, didn't remain in its location. So I believe this is uh, where the fountain used to be. And, right. uh, um, and at that point, is Liberty had uh, <clears throat> a different uh, vibe, um, you know, or at least uh, developers had also great expectations or making some sort of mall and everything. And eventually just things fell down. So uh, this is the piece that every, the location I'm gonna sh uh, share, uh, which is uh, highly identifiable. Um, it's at the Baum Boulevard um, intersection. There is the right in front of the Carnegie Library. And uh, so I'm just going to share. And uh, um, so here, um, Again, it stayed within the neighborhood. It's across, you know. Um, so, but again, uh, this was a case of uh, of a piece of art being uh, moved. There are a couple. Uh, if you want to add um, anything about this piece, feel um, uh, feel free. But uh, obviously, the joy of life spirit you can really <laughs> um, perceive it. Um, the only thing I'll add is I believe um, Virgil was still with us when this right. sculpture was relocated. So that that's also unique, you know, um, and we touched a little bit on this earlier for Lisa to be able to be be in the room, you know, kind of on behalf of when we when we don't have the art. I, I also work with an art foundation and have learned a lot about her public sculptures and you know when those were relocated and we could have the artists with us to help kind of direct that process and inform where and how um versus kind of having to make the effort on on their behalf it is an interesting uh i think um challenge sometimes but also opportunity and there were some modifications made to the that sculptural fountain and it's yeah in, it was the base that upset my father the most the, the original base in the first photograph was much more of a half globe, but the, there wasn't the space where they relocated it to to have that um, because it was, uh, I think it was a, a, a welded metal base that the sculpture, that the fountain sat on, but now it's on like a concrete thing, a concrete pad. Mm -hmm. The next, I believe, is one of two pieces uh, which have different faith. Okay, so let me share it. Okay, so this is the um, uh, New Horizon uh, Skyscape. Uh, this is within the University of Pittsburgh. Um, <clears throat> Melissa, you spent some time <clears throat> telling mm -hmm. us about this piece that is hanging. So mm -hmm. I think the students do have a nickname for it. <laughs> <laughs> I don't I, I know what they call it. <laughs> what, do you uh, know what they call uh, it? I, I think it's uh, the death trap or something like that. But <laughs> yeah. I think they should actually change their attitude towards it when they have a big exam. Go there, kind of make a good wish <laughs> 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 and turn it into a lucky... <laughs> Yeah, and this piece was originally made for the Horns department store, I, I want to say in right. Greensburg. It is Greensburg, yes. So mm -hmm. this was originally, so when we talk about um, how sometimes it's important to see an artwork in situ in its original location, this would be one where when you see it in context in the department store, uh, it's going to have possibly a different interpretation. Now it's in a student space, so I could see where students having anxiety about exams and might be looking at that and might be thinking this is a bit of what it feels like in my head right now because I've <laughs> got a lot of things going on, you know. Um, so that's also why we, as preservationists and historians, love all the imagery of what things look like during different stages of its life as an artwork. It was originally suspended from the ceiling at Joseph Horn's. 
but it was a smaller department store and it was either maybe three stories or two stories. So either side were the elevators or the escalators going up and down. So when people went up, they saw a different part of it. Uh, now, if I don't know if this is uh, uh, the second piece, I will be sharing it. Uh, but I think uh, you, Lisa, actually your husband had to go and get it. Uh, and this is the one that is located in, uh, I think in Greensburg. Um, mm, I, that is one I don't know. Okay. I, um, I honestly think that somebody, uh, somebody tried to add things to it because mm -hmm. my dad did not do it that way. This yeah, central yeah. part was his, but those extra pieces with the dots, those were not his. There were, uh, yes, there were, uh, there was indication that additions were, uh, were, were made. Yeah. Made. And I don't yes. know where that ever was. Mm -hmm. No. And sometimes the problem is, again, you have this uh, amazing art uh, work that you're trying to also relocate in other, and <clears throat> it might not be as easy as knocking someone's door and say, would you like to host this uh, artwork, right? It becomes, it can become uh, um, challenging. Well, we're getting closer to our time together, and I would like to uh, kind of spend a couple of minutes um, talking about uh, the female figures in your uh, family. Um, Lisa, you had a sister, Maria, who yes, was yes. Uh, a uh, she was a writer and a poet, and uh, um, unfortunately, she's no longer uh, with us. Uh, but um, uh, her words. Um, along with your father's work, uh, gave the birth to a coin that I'm going to share. And uh, I believe this is the two of them collaborating on on, on this piece on the... Uh, right. She, the yes. Yeah. Her words were, you shared your joy with the less than joyful lot. And um, there was a longer poem that I didn't know about, but Melissa did because the gentleman who was the head of the Roberto Clemente, I think it was the foundation, got in touch with us last year because this past fall was the anniversary for Clemente and Melissa had found the poem. But those medallions were minted and they were sold at um, PNC Bank. Mm -hmm. And there was also a gold one as well. There was a, it was probably the size of oh, a silver dollar, but I thought my mother had one in her jewelry box, but I could never found it when that gentleman contacted us a year ago. Well, then you also mentioned uh, the uh, very special lady in the family, which is your mom, Lucille. Uh, this picture I'm going to share, I believe, is still coming from the archives um, of the uh, Detri Library. We talked a little bit about uh, her being an, an artist herself and the flower gardens. <laughs> no, that was at her mother's home mm -hmm. in the North Hills. I think that may have been when they were still at Carnegie Tech and after mm -hmm. the war. Um, and she did enameling. Mm hmm and made jewelry and uh, special ashtrays. So she did a lot of commission pieces for people. Mm -hmm. um, she loved to draw flowers. Okay. And uh, so how long were they um, married? They were married 62 years. Wow. Wow. Fantastic. So uh, any last words from uh, um, any of you before we go into our closing? Obviously, the invitation to the whole public to go and visit the installation and uh, get involved into uh, the preservation of art. Um, I don't know, maybe coming from uh, Rome, where every time we try to build a new line for the underground, we had to stop and it takes us 20 years because we start finding chips and <laughs> <laughs> uh, these, uh, you know, sounds to me, even uh, the, the civic arena that to me was a landmark of Pittsburgh, especially when you flew into Pittsburgh, seeing this Oculus um, um, that is no longer with us. Um, but uh, anyway, uh, I'm not an expert. I just know what kind of I like and the fact that uh, we as, uh, you know, we all have to get uh, involved 
uh, because it does take um, everyone's efforts uh, in it. So any last thoughts, invitations, or what you might be working on next? Uh, Melissa, let's start with, uh, with you. Sure. So we're uh, entering the summer season, which is always busy because I try to get out and about and visit different communities, go to some of the festas and celebrations that are happening. Um, I'm quite excited because I'll be headed to New York in June to actually attend an NEH workshop that is around this theme of um, public spaces and memorials, monuments, things created by Italian immigrants and Italian Americans. So I'm excited to go to another city and spend a little time learning about some of the things made by Italians and also meeting other colleagues who are interested in this subject. Um, because in the United States, we're in a pretty interesting moment of history when it comes to our relationships with these different um, pieces of public art, and many of which are owned by cities and states and other uh, government entities. Mm -hmm. uh, for you, Brittany. Um, let's see. Uh, we have a lot brewing with our Pittsburgh Modern Committee of Preservation Pittsburgh. So we continue focusing on um, modernist post-war public art, um, architecture and design um, as we did with this project. So we are developing a short video series that will highlight um, special places and, and sites that we feel are really kind of vital to Pittsburgh's um, built environment, but maybe don't get a, as much eyes on them as historic as, as they deserve. So we always, and, and we'll have a special programming in the fall season to be announced. Um, yeah, and I just want to put out an invitation to Preservation Pittsburgh works with um, community members, you know, if if you're a, um, if, you, if there's something in your neighborhood, um, or that you have seen around the city that you have questions about or concern about, always feel free to reach out to us because um, we can kind of help you to, you know, match make and partner with the right people to um, help you know, just understand the process and, and support what you're doing to kind of uh, get an action plan in order. So just wanted to put out that that invitation that we're here to be open to ideas and, and efforts because it communities are the experts and the ones that often have the most energy to put towards uh, projects like this about things that matter to them in their in their neighborhoods. And uh, Lisa, some words from you, maybe how you would like uh, uh, your father to be remembered by. I mean, he also blessed. We we didn't really talk about his academia, uh, his academic uh, life, because in you said the 38 years, um, okay. I'm sure it has changed the life of many of thousands and thousands of, of, uh, of people. So one last thought about uh, Virgil Cantini, the artist and the man. Oh. My dad, um, I think he would like to be remembered for the types of various art that he did, that it wasn't just working in one media. He did all sorts of things. And I think the, the key thing to him is that he believed that every man should be able to experience art. And so that's why he was such an advocate of public art it didn't fall upon you to have to pay an admission fee to a museum or go to a certain part of a city and go into a gallery. You could walk around your city and experience a monument, a tunnel, a mural, whatever. And, and that's really, I believe, what he would want to be known for. He wanted every man to be able to feel and be inspired or thought provoked by a piece of artwork that they, en they encountered on their day-to-day -day journey. And in fact, there was one gentleman when we had the presentation at the History Center who stood up, I think he was the first commentator, and he said, I didn't know anything about Virgil Cantini, but I take the tea every day. And one day I walked through this corridor and he said, it, it, just made my day. It was so interesting and lively and beautiful. That's what my dad would have wanted to hear. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. 
Uh, well, our time together, unfortunately, is up. Il Big Ben ha detto stop. It is time for us to say arrivederci e alla prossima. We want to thank you for tuning in into the program. If you have any questions or comments, or if you have any topics you would like us to address, please contact us at the Italian Radio Hour at gmail.com. We would love to hear from you. And remember, if you or any of your family and friends have missed a prior episode or would like to listen to this episode again, Subscribe to the Italian Radio Hour on YouTube or where you catch your favorite podcasts. I cannot express my gratitude for the presence of these three amazing ladies, guests, fighters. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, starting with uh, Lisa Cantine Seguin, uh, Brittany Raleigh, Melissa Marinero, our sponsors, Istituto Mondo Italiano and La Prima Espresso. And until next time, alla prossima. Ciao, ciao. Bye-bye. Yeah.